Hello again, Grace Fellowship family and friends. We continue today with the next message from Pastor Randy Roberts' Ever Ready series, which is entitled, When the Bridegroom is Late. Have you ever been waiting at a wedding for a member of the wedding party to show up? If you think about it, we have been waiting for the bridegroom all of our lives. This is a reality. We have been waiting for the return of Christ. How should we deal with this wait? Today's message is one that will make us think and focus on the important activity of waiting for our Lord's return. Please join me as we listen to When the Bridegroom is Late. It's weird, Katie. I never thought of Kelly like that. <laughs> what if she likes me? She did grab my arm after saying that girls do that to guys they like. <laughs> she doesn't like me. Does she? Uh, I can't figure out my book, let alone a relationship. Uh, okay, I, w I will pick up the food t today. Yeah. I appreciate your understanding. I feel like I can open up to you, you know? What should I do with my emotional life? Hmm? Help me. Do you believe in love at first sight? On your first date? Yeah. He asked me that on the first date. Wow. <laughs> the little freak out <laughs> panic moment. <laughs> I bet. Oh, they're so adorable. I thought I'd found that once. Really? What happened? I wanted more and she didn't. Aw. Do, 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 I'm sorry for you. The truth is, she was seeing another man. Oh. Yeah. That was the worst thing ever. She hurt you pretty bad, huh? Uh, no, I was talking about your violin playing. What? Mm -hmm. You didn't like my violin playing? <laughs> Who are you right now? You were a Viking with no fingers oh, trimming yeah. his beard. Oh. Okay, I, that was a setup. But I got you. I did. You deserve it. You're making fun of my violin. <laughs> so, um, what's your excuse for not being in a relationship for the last decade? Um... Well, there was a wedding called off on my behalf. Really? Are we, are we talking Julia Roberts' runaway bride called off or Julia Roberts' my best friend wedding called off? Runaway bride. You almost got married? What is it with you and Julia Roberts' chick flick? You, you almost got married? Yes. How yes. come you've never told me this? Well, when we were dating, it was perfect. Um, and then he was late to our wedding. I'm not ready. I was young and I panicked. I just like freaked out. Where was he? What was he doing? Who was he with? Is he just being mean and selfish? Like, what kind of father would he be? What are his goals? I hate my life. I was totally wrong though. He's a missionary doctor. He was great. Mm, yeah, he sounds like a real rotten guy. Oh, he was just yeah. the worst. Mm. I don't know. It was completely in my head. I couldn't commit to anything. I couldn't commit to the relationship. I couldn't commit to the flowers. I couldn't commit to the choreographed dance. Choreographed dance? No, it's Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler? Yeah. It was bad. Oh, it was a bad choice. I'm not. Okay. Yeah. What do you think they're talking about? Oh, uh, I would fight another man with my bare hands just to win your love. <laughs> when you talk to me, your breath comes right at me and it <clears throat> smells of lilacs and 
possibilities. Uh, when, when I gaze upon your face, it's as though I'm bathing in sparkling cider. <laughs> when I get home. Oh, uh, oh, okay. Oh, ow, ow. Mm, this is a delicious scone. Take a picture, it'll last longer. Oh, no, I'm no. sorry. We were just admiring yeah. you two. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> How long have you two been together? Oh, 48 years. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> Seems like 70. <laughs> well, we got married really young. Yeah. Well, we would have been younger, except Captain Scaredy Pants was dragging his feet. Well, I was a little, you know. Slow. <laughs> <laughs> You're always late. You were late to our wedding. Mm. That's why I call you Speedy. He was late to your wedding? Mm hmm. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's not always easy. We have our faults. Mm. He's stubborn as a mule, and. I'm perfect. <laughs> what she really means is that she is a lying hag and I'm always right. <laughs> <laughs> but I know his heart's in the right place. Our relationship's always been fun. Yeah, and passionate. <sighs> yeah, he has a good soul, a kind soul. She is the best. <laughs> but, you know, you're past the hard part, you know, first finding someone, that special someone, and now it's time to just Make you know. babies. Oh. Uh, uh, there's no. We're <laughs> I I we're not baby making no. people. We're 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 just friends. Yeah, we're friends. We're friends in it's, boxes, and so there's not like there's, a cross. There's no. I I to, never jump in. Yeah. The, that we never stack our boxes. boxes. No, our boxes we're in are separate always crates. like side by side, but not touching side by side. No. There's like a space. Between. Yeah. There's a buffer. There's like a buffer. Yeah. A buffer. It's a buffer. Yeah. yeah like, like a neutral buffer. zone. Neutral. Exactly. Yeah. It's neutral. neutral it's, it's never never. Keep. No, nope. <laughs> because that would be weird. weird. It's like this is always between us. It's like a cactus, a cactus. is just like you don't want to uh, it's just prickly. <laughs> don't, don't get you. No, they took oh, you touched me. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, yeah, mace. Mace. <laughs> My the stranger eyes. danger. The stranger. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, we're yep. not friends. No. We're enemies. No. Yes. We need to go. No. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Bye. 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 <laughs> um. Why am I touching this stone with my hands? I don't know. I all the time I feel very much aware of my hands. <laughs> I know. What, are <laughs> what do they I doing? do with my hands? <laughs> I'm just Where do I put them? <laughs> I'm on the table. With I them. won't put them by you. No, don't. I won't. I'll just keep them to myself. Like in my pockets. Pockets. <laughs> Pocket hands. Is our media crew amazing or what? It's just excellent. So have you ever been late to a wedding? Have you ever been in the wedding and you're late to the wedding? Have you ever been there? I've been there before, back years ago, before there were smartphones and map apps. I was late to a wedding, 30 minutes late. I was later to discover that the directions I had been given, you know, the kind of drawn on the napkin kind of directions, were missing one key term which led to almost an hour of frenzied activity on my part, racing down the freeway, racing up and down surface streets, praying for a phone booth, trying to find a police officer, anything to tell me where this place was. Finally, it ended with me squealing into the parking lot, stopping, looking up at the wedding venue, and there was the bride, staring out the door, looking like she had lost her last friend or her only minister. <laughs> It was a horrible experience. That affected me so much that these days I'm obsessive about getting to weddings, not just on time, but early. Getting there early just in case anything goes wrong. Which means that I've spent a lot of time waiting at wedding venues. Just waiting. Now, as I've been thinking about this, it strikes me, I, I don't mean to be politically incorrect here, but most of my waiting has been on the bride and on her party. I don't know what that says, it's just what has happened. Some of my waiting has been on family members. That has happened. There was even one occasion when we all waited for a member of the clergy for two hours. But that's another story for another time. But as I was thinking about this this week, it suddenly struck me that in all the waiting I have done at wedding venues, I don't know what this says, but I have never waited on the groom. 
I don't know what that means. I've never waited on the bridegroom. Except that as I thought more about it, I realized that the truth is, is that I've spent my entire life waiting on the bridegroom. And it seems to me that the bridegroom is late to the wedding. Many of you have been waiting, waiting your life, waiting for the bridegroom. And none of us, I'm going to guess, likes to wait. Do you know anybody that likes to wait? I don't like to wait. Why don't we like to wait? Well, waiting puts us out of control. Somebody else is in control. We're just out of control. We're just waiting. Or sometimes we don't like to wait because we don't know how long the wait is going to be. Some companies are dealing with that now. When you call them on the phone and when you finally get through the endless phone tree, you're trying to get to a live human voice, finally somebody says in a recorded voice, uh, your wait is approximately four minutes. Or you will wait for the next eight minutes. At least you have a sense of how long it will be. Some companies, one of the airlines I call frequently, even has now the option where they say, if you don't want to wait on the phone, Give us your number, your name. We'll call you back. 30 minutes. You don't have to wait. So they're trying to deal with that reality that we just don't like waiting. But here we sit waiting for the bridegroom. Because of that, I have a question that I'd like to ask you. It's an important question. I don't want you to answer reflexively. I'd like you to think about it. Here's the question. If Jesus were not coming back a second time, if the second coming of Christ weren't a cardinal biblical doctrine, if at the end of this road he wasn't coming to take us home, would you still follow him? If Jesus were not coming a second time, would you still follow him? I think it's an important question, maybe made more important by a quotation that I'd like to read to you. It comes from a well-known book many of us have read more than once, a book entitled Desire of Ages, written by Ellen White. Listen to these words. It is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. They behold the Savior's matchless love revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross, and the sight of him attracts. It softens and subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholders. They hear his voice, and they follow him. So if you were asked to summarize what it is that that paragraph is saying, I'm curious how you would summarize it. I think here's what I would say. That first sentence, it is not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. I think I would summarize that by simply saying, it isn't fearing the fires of hell or being allured by the streets of gold that draws the true disciple to follow Jesus. I think that's what the first sentence says. And then what about the next sentences? They behold the Savior's matchless love, revealed throughout, <clears throat> throughout his pilgrimage on earth, from the manger to the cross, and the sight of him attracts, it softens, subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholders. They hear his voice, and they follow him. It seems to me that those sentences are talking about who he is, his character, what he stands for, what he's like, and that it's saying they get a glimpse of who he is, and they are drawn to that as the primary motivating factor in becoming disciples. So then what is the paragraph saying? I think it's simply saying that the true disciple is primarily motivated to follow Jesus, not by eternity, but by his character, by his person, by his love. 
So my question again, if Jesus weren't coming a second time at the end of this road, would you still follow him? Would it be enough in the here and now to know him? It's an important question because today's parable, or the well-known parable of the ten virgins or the ten bridesmaids, today's parable uses that concept of knowing him in a very important way. In fact, I'd like to put two pieces of background in place before we read the parable. And they both have to do with that concept of knowing him and Jesus knowing us. I know you or I never knew you. So two pieces of background in place. The first piece uh, we put in place with the words of New Testament scholar Michael Wilkins, who is writing about today's parable. Now, he's writing about the punchline, the end piece of the parable. So I apologize for reading this in advance, but it will help us put in place what will allow the parable to have its impact on us. So here are Wilkins' words. The foolish virgins finally arrive, but the bridegroom calls out to them as they stand in the night darkness, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. A stark, straightforward statement of rejection of a person who does not have a true relationship with Jesus. Throughout the Old Testament, God is said to know those whom he has chosen to be his people, a theme reiterated through the New Testament to speak of a saving relationship found with God through Jesus Christ. I don't know you, or I know you, in other words, is used to speak of the absence or the presence of a saving relationship with Jesus. That's the first piece of background. The second piece of background comes here in Matthew's Gospel. We're going to read from Matthew's Gospel the parable of the ten virgins. But I want to go back earlier in the Gospel, back to the Sermon on the Mount. Because there in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes a similar kind of statement. It includes that same phrase. And that statement is made regarding what he will say to people who claim to have ministered in his name. So back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, and I read these words, starting with verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me you evildoers. So that phrase, I don't know you, I never knew you, speaks of the lack of a saving, intimate, authentic relationship with Jesus. So bear that in mind as we read today's parable. It's the second of four parables that Jesus tells in order to explain to his disciples, in order to tell us what it means to live ever-ready lives. Matthew chapter 25 I'll read beginning in verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied, There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came, Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Ten bridesmaids, five wise, five foolish. I suppose the immediate and natural question when you read those opening words of the parable is, 
So what makes some wise and some foolish? What is the distinction between the two? I want to be wise. So what makes the difference? Well, I would think, I would think that the answer to that would be quite clear. I mean, after all, you have sleeping involved in this when people should be watching. So I would think the answer would be fairly clear, especially when you place it against the backdrop of Scripture and even Matthew's gospel itself, where when people are supposed to be watching and instead they are sleeping, that is spoken of in very negative terms. In fact, just about a chapter further in Matthew's gospel, we'll come to the story of Gethsemane. Jesus and the disciples have just come from the upper room where the disciples have been pledging their loyalty. And Jesus tells them, now, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. He goes a little aside. He begins to pray, goes back to see them, and they're sound asleep. You can almost hear the, the sorrow in Jesus' voice. The surprise, the incredulity when he says, what? You couldn't even watch with me for one hour? I thought you were going to be watching. Instead, you're sleeping. So to me, it seems that when we ask what makes the difference between the wise and the foolish, it seems that the answer actually is quite clear. The difference is made in whether or not they fall asleep or stay awake. They're waiting for the bridegroom. Admittedly, the bridegroom's late, but they should be awake and they should be watching. Uh, that's what I would think until I read verse 5. And there in verse 5, it says, The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all slumbered and slept. Uh, I have to be honest, that's a bit surprising. That's a little bit unnerving because it does away with my theory. And furthermore, it says one or two other things that are interesting. For example, it says that it is possible to be both asleep and ready. It is possible to doze off and still meet the bridegroom in peace. It, it, it also says something else. In fact, I wonder, is Jesus trying to communicate something to his followers about the delay? Do you suppose that Jesus was trying to warn them it's going to be a long time? Do you suppose Jesus was trying to tell them it is not spiritually possible, it is not humanly possible, it is not spiritually healthy to always try to live in the heat of anticipation, standing on the tiptoe of expectation? That's not possible. That can't happen. That's not a healthy spiritual life. That isn't true to the life around you. And because of that, there will come times when you come down off the mountaintop experience and you live in the valley. When you spiritually are putting one foot in front of the other, you're just making it. Jesus coming? Well, he may be coming, but truth is, that seems so far away. That seems so impossible right now. I'm just trying to make it one day at a time. You suppose Jesus was trying to speak to some of us who have gone through times like that? Is it possible that he's trying to say, even if you don't have that peak experience all the time, it is still possible to sleep and be ready? Could Jesus be saying that? I want you to listen to the words of a New Testament scholar named Eugene Boring. I have to confess, as I was reading what he had to say, I thought, what would it be like to be a scholar and a preacher with a last name like 
boring. <clears throat> it's got to be tough. Who's preaching this week? Boring. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, I want you to listen to what Eugene Boring has to say about this parable. He writes, Right at the beginning of the parable of the ten bridesmaids, Jesus tells us that five of them were foolish and five were wise. The reason why he tells us this from the outset is that we cannot tell this just by looking at them. All ten have come to the wedding. All ten have their lamps aglow with expectation. All ten presumably have on their bridesmaid gowns. We would never guess from appearances that half are wise and half foolish. No, it is not the looks, the lamps, or the long dresses that sets the wise apart from the foolish. It's the readiness. Five of the bridesmaids are ready for the groom to be delayed, but the other five are not. The wise have enough oil for the wedding, <coughs> pardon me, to start whenever the groom arrives. The foolish have only enough oil for their own timetable. Five are prepared and ready, even for a delay, five are not. Readiness in Matthew is, of course, living the life of the kingdom, living the quality of life described in the Sermon on the Mount. Many can do this for a short while, but when the kingdom is delayed, then problems arise. Being a peacemaker for a day is not as demanding as being a peacemaker year after year when the hostility breaks out again and again and the bridegroom is delayed. Being merciful for an evening can be pleasant. Being merciful for a lifetime when the groom is delayed requires preparedness. At the beginning of the life of faith, you cannot really tell the followers of Jesus apart. They all have lamps. They're all excited about the wedding. They all know how to sing, Lord, Lord. But deep into the night, when we spot some persons attempting in vain to fan a dying flame to life, we begin to distinguish wisdom from foolishness. Now, follow what Boring is saying. What he's saying is, if I have a timetable, if I need Jesus to come and to come soon in order to maintain my spiritual life, if that is the prime motivating factor in following him, then I will be in very deep trouble if my timetable is not honored. If the bridegroom's late to the wedding, Suddenly, the difference between wisdom and foolishness becomes apparent. Foolishness becomes apparent because I simply can't deal with the delay. I need the coming. I need it now for my life spiritually to be robust. But the wisdom of the five wise maidens says there is something in the readiness I possess that can deal with the delay. It doesn't have to be on my timetable. And I can still be ready. So my question is, what is it about that? What is that readiness? And especially since we notice in reading the parable that it has to do with the oil, then my question is, does the oil mean something? Some Bible scholars say, no, it does not. The oil simply stands for readiness. They're ready, regardless of when it occurs. But some others take issue with that and say, no, there, there's something in the oil. Maybe it does have a meaning. It seems to me, if you look at it once again against the backdrop of Scripture, and against the fact that oil can at times have a saving, a salvific meaning, that maybe actually, actually the oil does stand for something. Let me read to you these words from the little book, Christ Object Lessons, writing about this parable. It says, The two classes of watchers represent the two classes who profess to be waiting for their Lord. They are called virgins because they profess a pure faith. By the lamps is represented the Word of God. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. 
If we accept that, then the picture that emerges is this. When the five are not ready and Jesus says, I don't know you, he's saying, there is no deep, intimate, authentic relationship between us. But to those who are ready, the Holy Spirit, whose job it is to magnify Jesus, has created with them a deep and a continuing walk with him every day of their lives. Kept that shining in their hearts through good times and bad, through mountains and valleys, at times of joy and times of sorrow, there is still a developing relationship with Jesus. Whether the bridegroom is on time or greatly delayed. Now remember, what Jesus is using here in this parable is the metaphor of a wedding. I've had the wonderful privilege throughout the years of pastoral ministry, to officiate at many weddings. It's, it's a wonderful privilege. It's one of those great joys of ministry. As I think about weddings, I think about that, that day in this couple's life when romance is in the air. He looks suave and debonair, or as my friend Doug Mays says it, he looks suave and debonair. <laughs> she looks as beautiful as she's ever looked. There are tears in the eyes of both sets of parents. There's a sense of romance that pervades the occasion. You look at them and you think, the world is their oyster, the the road ahead of them. What will they make of it? Now, there are ways, there are ways from scholarship, we know, to detect whether or not there might be trouble ahead for them or not. I'm going to suggest just one that if this couple has this one trait, there's trouble ahead. And here's the trait. If they look at this wedding experience, the romance, the specialness, the joy, all of that, and they say to themselves, this is what married life is going to be. One uninterrupted ecstasy of joy. (laughs) It's going to be a long, hot summer. I can tell you right now there's trouble because the reality is while there will be those moments and there should be those experiences, there will be many others as well. And it is when they understand that, that this is a part of what life is. Doesn't mean I'm with the wrong person. This is just life, no matter who I might have married. They're well served by that reality because it's true. As much as we may love each other, as much as we may enjoy the great moments, marriage has its life. Like the guy I read about this last week. Just this last week, I read about this guy. Been married, but not overly long, I guess. Went out in what was described as a blowing blizzard. Don't know what he was doing, but he went out in this, walked a half a mile to a bakery and walked into the bakery. I guess he was the only one there and told the baker, I want six of those rolls. The baker looked up at him and said, wow, your wife must really like these rolls. And the man said, I didn't say anything about my wife. What do you mean my wife? The guy said, oh yeah, I knew it was your wife. Your mother would never send you out in this weather. (laughs) So I don't know. (laughs) There do come those moments on both sides, his and hers. But if we recognize that it is in those times that we continue to craft and to build a healthy, robust marriage, then we are well served. So I come back to the question. If Jesus weren't coming a second time, if that weren't a cardinal biblical doctrine, would you still follow him? Would you still choose him because of who he is, because of his character, because of the matchless charms of Christ? Would you walk with him out of the joy of his companionship? It's an important question. Now the truth is, 
The truth of this parable and of this book is this. The bridegroom will return. The bridegroom will come. In fact, it says here that at midnight, somebody raised the cry, here comes the bridegroom. And immediately, the ten maidens jump up to touch up so they can meet up with the bridegroom. They get ready for his arrival. And that's when the key discovery is made between wise and foolish. Here's my question about that. What does it mean to get ready for the arrival of the bridegroom? They jumped up. They're trimming their lamps. What does it mean for us to get ready? Does it mean that we frantically now try to develop a relationship with Jesus? Does it mean that we run around making amends with people we've hurt but we've been holding off apologizing to? Does it mean that we suddenly alter our behavior? Does it mean we clean things up with the IRS? What does it mean? to say, we get ready for the coming of the bridegroom. Remember, this parable is relentlessly relational. I think what it means is what my mom did. In my teen teen years, we lived in Mexico and we lived in Guatemala City. My two older siblings, John and Lindy, were away at college here in the United States. But when vacation time would roll around, when Thanksgiving came, when Christmas arrived, they would come home for the holidays. We always yearned for those times when they would come home. But I can remember as the time approached, as the day approached, as the hour approached, we would go into a flurry of activity at home, getting ready for them to come. Because mom, for her, getting ready for her kids to come home meant that the house got cleaned. Randy, sweep out and back. Randy, dust here. Mary Ellen, do, and, and we would get caught up in all the activity. She'd go into the bedrooms where they were going to stay, clean sheets on the beds, fresh towels, fresh linens. It was an exciting time. And then would begin to waft through the house the tantalizing aromas of John's and Lindy's favorite dishes. What was mom doing? Was she frantically preparing because she was fearful that when they came, they they would be angry if all this wasn't done? Was she preparing? Because somehow, if she didn't, there would be a fracture in that relationship. Was she preparing out of fear that if they walked in and the house wasn't ready, they'd turn around and walk out, and away they'd go back to college? None of the above. She was preparing because of the relationship she had with her children that she wanted to welcome them home in the fashion that said, we have missed you. We're so excited you're home. We celebrate your homecoming. And we want to honor you as part of our family. That's what she was doing. It was a relationally driven preparation, a preparation that says, I know you. And I love you. And I do all of this to celebrate your homecoming. I think there may be something in people who have decided Jesus is enough. I want to walk with him now. I want our lives to be intertwined. I want my heart to be his home. I revel in his matchless charms. And do you know what? Besides all of that, at the end of the road, I get to see him face to face. I think there's something in that for us. Kind of like the little girl came home from church. Her daddy said to her, so what did you learn today in the children's lesson? What did they talk about? Well, Daddy, they they talked about God and Enoch. Enoch, yes. The one who was not because God took him? Yes, Daddy, that's what they said. Do you understand what that means? Well, I thought about it, Daddy. I think it means that God and Enoch liked each other, so they went on walks together. And they liked each other so much that every day they would walk a little further and a little further just to have more time together. 
I think it means, Daddy, that one day they walked so far, they enjoyed it so much, that God finally said to Enoch, Enoch, today we're closer to my home than we are to yours, so let's go home to my place. I think, Daddy, that's what it meant. Do you suppose that's what it means? That you can walk with Jesus every day. Moments when you're wide awake. Moments when you doze off. You can walk with him every single day by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in your heart and life. All the way to the day when God says to you, you know what? The table is set. The wedding is prepared. And the guests are waiting. Come on. Let's go home for the wedding supper of the Lamb.